Okay, so last class we talked about um, present value, future value, when we have single contributions or single withdrawals, either at the beginning or the end. And we know either the time period or we know the interest rate. And we can figure out if from three of the variables, we can figure out the fourth. Okay, so if I say I have $50,000 now, I need $100,000. And I think I can earn 5%. How long is it going to take me to get there? You could answer that question. Or if you say, I am investing $50,000 now at a rate of 5% for 10 years, what's it going to be worth in the future? You can answer that question. Or I need $100,000 in the future five years from now at 8%. How much do I have to put in now? Any of those, you know, those are all kind of equivalent questions, slightly different algebra, but the same formula. Okay? Now we're moving into the direction of talking about annuities, which are, instead of there being one payment and it's just going to collect interest or, um, or compound, we're going to instead talk about making annual deposits. And this is a much more common um, situation if you think about a company buying something using a payment plan. So you say, okay, well, the company buys something, and instead of paying in cash up front, they pay their supplier $100,000 each year for the next five years. Okay? There's no, not necessarily an explicit interest rate, but obviously the fact that you're not paying up front, the company is implicitly charging you some interest embedded in that original price. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how you would compute uh, the value of these sorts of contracts. And the importance of this is, let's suppose I am buying a machine today. And the terms of the machine say, put down $100,000 now, and then another $100,000 each year for the next four years. So how much total cash would I be using in that contract? 100 now, and then 100 for the next four years. $500,000. So when I buy that machine, should I write asset 500,000 cash 100 notes payable or something like that? Should I is that how I record the purchase? So basically, I'm saying, okay, I, I give you, you're giving me a machine, and it's going to cost me $500,000. I'm going to pay 100 now, and the other 100 in four installments each, or the other 400 in 100,000 dollar installments. Is that how you would record that? Am I getting today a machine worth $500,000? Yes. Really? If I can't fill that machine in cash today, would I have to pay $500,000 for it? Why not? Or why yes? I mean, some people say yes, some people say no. Why is the machine worth 500 or isn't the machine worth 500 Why is it worth less? Okay. Okay, so the present, so why do I, what is the present value? Why am I missing? at the present value. Okay, so I like some of what you said. This is what it's worth now. So if I were to pay for it in cash right now, here's how much I would have to pay, which is less than $500,000. What does the $500,000 represent? Yeah. Okay, I don't like the word depreciation yet, but I like the word interest. So what I'm paying in that bundle of $100,000 payments is interest. Okay, I'm paying not only for the machine, but I'm paying for the fact that I don't have to pay for the machine right away. So if I bought the machine today, it would cost me less than a total of $500,000. Okay, so the machine, its historical cost is not the cash I pay, because the cash I pay needs to be allocated both to the 
value of the machine and to the value of the loan. Right? If I had just borrowed money from the bank and bought the equipment today, I would record the equipment at its current purchase price, which is the historical cost. And then I would just pay interest to, on the loan. Well, if I borrow the money from the person selling me the machine, the asset should have the same value up front. But it shouldn't matter whether I borrow the money from the bank or I borrow the money from the supplier. The asset value should be the same. What the remainder of the cost is, is its interest payment. Okay, so don't write this down, or write this down and then put a big giant X on it. Okay, this is not what I would do. Okay, I need to figure out, I'm buying the machine today, what is the value of the asset in today's terms? And then, when I make a $100,000 payment next year, some of it is going to pay off the note, which is the obligation that I, I incur today, and some of it is paying interest on the note. Okay, so I need to figure out what is the present value of that stream of payments. So here's the example, instead of using the, the numbers I gave you, let's say the company is putting $30,000 every year in a fund for eight years. Okay, so this is what they're doing. Every year they're putting $30,000 in. And the fund earns 12% interest per year. And I put in the payments, so this is now. And I put in the first payment at the end of the year. So right now, let's say we're on 1-1-2010. And I put in the first payment, 12-31-2010. Okay, so at the end of the year. Is that an annuity due or is that an ordinary annuity? Ordinary, right? Ordinary is when you put it at the end. Annuity due is when it's due immediately. Okay, so this is an ordinary annuity. What amount is in the fund immediately after the last deposit? So on 1231, 20, 2018, I guess, not 20, going back in time here. Okay, on 20, 1231-2018, when I made my last deposit, how much is in the account? Okay, so this is a little bit different from what we had done before. I could tell you, well, if I have $30,000 and I put it in an account for eight years, I could have told you what that was worth last class, right? Put it in an account, I earn 12%, I just compound it, I take $30,000 times 1.12 raised to the 8, done, right? In this case, it's only seven years of compounding because technically I'm asking what's it worth before the, you know, it only has a chance to include seven years of interest. But what do I do when I have an annuity? Well, now I have this earning seven years of interest, this earning six years of interest, this earning five, and so on and so forth. So now it's a little bit hard. I could still use the one formula that I knew from last class and just do a little bit more math. Or, what else could I do? There's a table for ordinary annuities. What else could I do? There's a formula for ordinary annuities. What else could I use? Use your fancy calculators. Plug in the payment, number of periods, but just make sure you're using the ordinary annuity. Okay, so what would this look like? Come on. Okay, so if we just stick with the one formula that we knew from last class, the last payment is just worth $30,000, right? Because I made it at the very last day. It hasn't had even one day to accrue any interest. So it's just worth $30,000. Well, 
okay? The payment I made one year before is worth $30,000 times 1.12, okay? The payment I made two years before the end is $30,000, 1.12 squared. Why? Why squared? Well, because I'm earning interest the first year, and then I'm earning interest on the $30,000 plus the 12% that I had earned in that first year, okay? So it's compounding. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is, this, here's the formula for an ordinary annuity, okay? You take one plus the interest rate, raised to the eighth power, okay, because that's the number of years. So 1.12 raised to the eighth, minus one, okay, and then you divide it by the interest rate. That's another way of doing it. You don't have to memorize this formula, okay? I, you can always look it up. You can always, I will give it to you. I'll give you the present value table that's on the table, okay? So you don't have to memorize the formula. The idea is just, this is going to give you a factor which will convert these eight payments of $30,000 each into the compounded value. The form, you know, it will give you a number that's kind of like close to 12.2. So what it's saying is, if I put in $30,000 a year for eight years, it's going to be worth $368 at the end of that eight-year period if it earned 12%. Okay, so that's just trying to show you how much you can convert $240,000 into 368, right? So you're only putting in 30 per year, but because it's generating interest, the nominal value of 240 turns into 368, okay? If you didn't remember a formula or will have a calculator or anything like that, all you have to do is you go to one of these tables. You say, oh, well, I've got eight periods, 12%. I'm looking at an ordinary annuity table, and done. Okay, so there's a whole host of ways. All of them are acceptable to me. I'm perfectly satisfied no matter how you want to calculate. Okay? Now, how does it differ? If instead of it being an ordinary annuity, it's an annuity due. What in the last example, how would that differ? We just have one more period in which you're going to earn interest, right? So now instead of it being uh, the la whoops, instead of the last period earning only seven periods of interest, you have you put it in one one ten and you take it out twelve thirty one. 17. So the first $30,000 payment has eight periods of interest to earn, rather than seven. The second has six, has seven. The third has, okay, so the only difference is every period gets taxed with another interest payment. Okay, so if I just use the formula from the last page and just hit it with another interest payment, I would have the formula for an annuity due. Okay? Same number of deposits. I'm not making another $30,000 payment. I'm still making eight payments of $30,000 each. It's just I'll make the first one in year one versus at the end of, in the beginning of year one versus the end of year one. Okay? So that's, there's not, I mean, these are pretty straightforward, but when would you do, when would you try and do a computation like this? If you are thinking, you know, you have your first job, you think, how much should I stock away each year in my retirement savings so that I'll have a million dollars to retire with when I'm 70 or 65 or however old, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to say, I can afford to make $35,000 deposits. Okay, I'm going to earn 8% annually. How many years do I have to work until I can finally retire with a million dollars? 
that might be a question you'll ask yourself. Now, you probably hopefully won't be asking you at your first job, your first day there, like, how long will it take before I can retire? But eventually, you're going to be asking yourself this question. And this is the kind, and, and this is sort of the simple analysis that you can do. Okay? How do I, so here's how I did it for you, but there's a whole host of ways you could do this problem. Okay? What, what you really want to capture is, I'm going to be making $35,000 payments every year, okay? And then I want the future value to be $1 million. Okay, so I, I know what I want the end value to be. I know what the annuity payment is. I know how much interest I can earn, which is 8% per year. And I have to say, how many of these payments am I going to have to put in? Now, I told you last class, I always want you to do, like, a reality check. So what would the reality check on this problem be? What is the number of years going to be less than in order for this problem to make any sense? Right, so, anyway, 30 years. Okay, that's, I guess, you know, a little bit. If I put in 30 payments... Okay, that would earn no interest and I would have about a million dollars. So, what can you tell me? The number better be less than 30, right? If I'm putting away money every year and I'm not getting any interest at all, then I'm not going to be very happy about that, okay? So, this way, I, I, should, I should be able to work a lot shorter because my money is working for me, right? I'm not just, you know, putting it under my mattress. I'm putting it in something they can generate um, 8% per year. Now, on the other hand, if you did just put it in your mattress, you'd need about 30 years until you had a million dollars in cash sitting there. So this is what's telling This should be telling you I should be able to do a lot better than that. All right, the mattress approach versus this. Okay, so what is the answer? Well, you can use the formula and then use the tricks of logs. Okay, you can use a table, you can use your calculator, you can actually do the sum. It's a little tedious here because you have to kind of guess and verify, okay? Because <laughs> you don't know what that number is. But in any event, it's not hard to do. It's just you need to like, think, well, what, what, would, what seems reasonable? What, where should I be? And then make sure your computations are consistent with that. Okay, now what is new wanted to do instead a future value of an annuity due. Well, again, it's the same thing, just one more period. So that's... I have all kinds of devices that are apparently ready to use. Okay, so future value of an annuity due. We said the only difference between that and an ordinary annuity is you've just got one more year of payment, or one more year of interest accruing on the same number of payments. Okay. If we want to do more interesting problems, maybe. Oops. So we want to figure out the present value rather than what's it going to be worth in the end. Meaning, what do I? How do I value my machine? And we just go in the other direction. So this is more like the example that I gave you in the very beginning, which is you buy a machine today, you need to record its value. Now, how would you normally know what the machine's value was? Well, there might be a list price which says, okay, here's how much it costs a regular person that wants to come in and just buy the machine off the shelf. Okay? So you might be charged interest based on some list price, and then you don't have to compute the present value because you know the list price, and then you can just figure out what the interest rate is. But in all likelihood, when a big company goes into a supplier, they don't necessarily pay the list price. They pay some negotiated price. And they don't know what the negotiated price is. They only know what the terms of the payments are. So then you have to figure out what is the value of the asset that I record on my books on day one. Why do I need to get that number right? 
So why do I, why can't why what would have been wrong if I had just reported asset five hundred thousand and obligation five hundred thousand or obligation four hundred cash a hundred in that very first example? What's the problem with that? I'm overstating the value of the asset. Okay, so from the get go, I'm recording some asset that doesn't really have a value that is nearly as high as what I've recorded. What what else is wrong with that? Okay, I don't owe five. If I were to go back, not only have I overstated my assets, but I've also overstated my obligations. Because when do I owe interest? Only after time has passed. And so the supplier can't legitimately ask me for the full $500,000 right up front because interest, time hasn't passed, interest isn't accrued. What else? What do I do with my machine that I own over time? Depreciate them. If I start with an asset that's overvalued, what's going to be the problem with that? What, 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 what will be incorrect about my depreciation? It'll be too high, right? I'll be taking too much depreciation expense. On the flip side, I won't be taking enough interest expense. And so we, interest expense and depreciation expense are two different kinds of expenses. Depreciation is a real cost of running the business. Interest is a choice of how do you finance. And people think about those two kinds of costs very differently. So if I think about, you know, how much, what kind of assets do I need to sustain this firm, that's a very different question than how should I raise money, should I borrow it, or should I sell stock, okay? And so by misclassifying the asset or mis mispricing the asset up front, I'm also putting my expenses in the wrong compartment. In one case, I would be putting them incorrectly into depreciation, where I should be considering them as an interest. Okay, so what is the you know sort of flip side of so we did the, the future value of an annuity? What is the flip side? Well, if I put in a dollar a year from now, what's that worth today? Well, less, right? Remember the very first thing I said, you know, you give me $10 now, I'll give you $10 three years from now, and nobody was willing to pick me up on that great deal. Well, that's because if I say I'll give you a dollar in a year, you would tell me, well, I'll only give you 89 cents today. Okay? If I give you a dollar in two years, that's really only worth 79 cents today. And if I give you a dollar in three years, that's so based on my example, you should only be willing to give me $7 now or $7.10 if I'm willing to give you, you know, $3, $10 three years from now. Yeah, was that a question? No, it was just a drinking. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so what, do you, what can you tell me about if I'm paying, making these $100,000 payments, how much should the value of my asset be? Should it be more or less than $500,000? What? How much should it be based on this? $360,000. And instead of making $1 payments, I'm making $100,000 payments. The first $100,000 payment, well, I, I assumed I made the first one immediately, but if I make the first one at the end of the first year, it's only worth $89,000. Second payment only worth $79,000, and so on. And so the value of that asset is significantly lower. Okay, then when I make a payment of $100,000, some of it goes to pay down my obligation that I had recorded up front. And where's the rest going? To interest. Okay, so I have cash going out, I reduce my liability, and I have an interest expense. Okay, so let's let's just try and do a couple of these. So let's say a company purchases an asset and agrees to make these periodic payments. On day one, you have to figure out what your asset is worth and what your obligation is. How do you recognize the value? You need to use the present value of the annuity or ordinary uh, ordinary annuity or annuity due. 
So when, when you say, are your assets recorded at historical cost, what does that exactly mean? What, is it, what does the historical cost mean when you're talking about an asset that you make payments on every year for a couple of years? What is, what is the cost? Is the cost to cash out? Okay, so it's just the present value of all of the payments, which represents the cost of buying it today and is irrespective of your financing choices. Okay? If you sell an asset, okay, and you agree to sell it for a specific number of payments, how do you decide what your gain or your loss on the asset is? Let's say you sell the asset and you're completely done. How much do you make on the asset versus how much is interest revenue? Well, I look at, so let's say my, what I paid for it was $100,000. And now I'm going to sell it for two payments of, a payment of $100,000 this year and $100,000 next year. Can I record a gain of $200,000? No, why not? Well, eventually, right? But I'm not getting it up front. So what am I doing instead? Okay, well, so I record some, the, what? The present value, okay? And then the first payment, some of it goes to paying off the accounts receivable or note receivable, and some of it goes towards interest revenue. Okay, I take in the cash, I get rid of the receivable, and I get some revenue. The revenue has nothing to do with the gain on the sale because the sale was set up to record a particular gain that just had to do with selling the asset for more or less than the book value. What happens afterwards is I have chosen to let the person finance that uh, purchase. And so I'm recording interest revenue, which is unrelated to the sale of the item. It's almost as if first I sell the item, they give me the money, and then I give it back to them and I say, here's a loan. Okay? That's how you want to think about it. You don't want to combine these two things together. There would be a gain. It would only be a gain to the extent of the present value. So you would take the present value of those $200,000 payments today, which would be less than $200,000. The gain is any excess over whatever the book value is, but it's not the full difference between 100 and 200. Okay. All right, so let's say I'm trying to figure out, this is a similar kind of problem, okay? I'm trying to figure out what the value, and why, I'll, I'll explain why you would want to do a problem like this in a minute, but let's say I'm going to rent out my building, okay? And I'm going to get payments of $6,000 per year for five years. Now, I have to decide to myself, would I rather sell this building right now or hang on to it and rent it out? So this is a kind of com question a company might be faced with. And they may say, well, I have somebody who's willing to lease it for five years. There's a five-year commitment. At the end of five years, it's going to be uh, you know, a shack anyway, so we can't, we can't use it. So I have to consider, should I sell it now, and let's say there's some offer on the table, or should I take these, should I continue to lease it out for the next five years? How are they going to make that decision? How are they going to decide which is better, the offer on the table right now or the payment? Okay, do I care? Let, so, so I'm sort of interested right now, should I sell it now? or hold it? Do I care what the payments are worth here? Right. Okay. So I care about right now. So what, what is the value to me of $6,000 next year, $6,000 the year after? So I, I figure out the value of that. So I need to take the present value of this stream. Is this an ordinary annuity or an annuity due? Ordinary, right? Because it's each the, the rental payments are going to be received at the end of each year. So I'm going to use the 12% discount rate. Again, any use your use the formula. Here's the formula. If you want it, you can use a table. You can do anything you want. 
What can you tell me about this? Don't even look at the formula. Don't look at the table. Don't look at your calculator. What is, am I going to have a present value of more or less than $30,000? Everybody should be telling you less, right? If I offer you $30,000 today or five payments of $6,000 each over the next five years, which would you rather? Take the cash right now. Why would you ever say, oh, yeah, hang on to, I mean, unless you're like a drug user who doesn't think that they can hang on to the money. But, I mean, realistically, that's not a good, that's not a good deal, right? It has to be the case that you um, <laughs> that you, that you, um, that you would rather take $30,000 in progress payments than take the money right now. Because what could you do? You could take the 30000 right now, and you could always just convert it into $6,000 payments with no risk, right? You can just give it to me. I'll hold it for you, okay? And I'll give you $6,000 a year. And then presumably what I could be doing is I could be investing it at least in, you know, something that would earn some interest, and I would get a little bit of money being your trustee. So clearly you've got to have something that's less than $30,000. How much less? Well, here's the factor, and it's just going to be $21,628, okay? So basically what, the, what you've done is you've taken this formula, which is just 1 minus, so 1 minus, 1 divided by 1 plus the interest rate, which here is 12%, okay, raised to the fifth power. Okay, and then you take the whole thing divided by the interest rate. Again, don't bother memorizing these formulas. I will give them to you if you need them. Okay, the idea is that you know where to look for the... You at least know this number should be smaller than $30,000, and you know how to get the number if required. Okay, so... Here's a real example. This is a real guy. Now, I didn't make this up, but I didn't pull this picture for Okay. So, here's a guy. He's just won the Powerball jackpot. Okay? When you see these Powerball listings, like, Powerball was worth $350 million. It's not really worth $350 million. I mean, it, it's worth a lot, don't get me wrong, but it's not worth $350 million. What they're telling you is that you will get nominal payments of $350 million. Okay, in this case, let's stick with this specific example. It's $258 million. Okay? So, here's a guy who just won a jackpot that will pay off 30 payments over 29 years of $258 million. So what kind of annuity is that? Is that an ordinary annuity or an annuity due? It's an annuity due. Why is it an annuity due? Because there's only, it's only 29 years with 30 payments. So what that means is the first payment is immediate. Okay? And then over the next 29 years, it will be a total of 30 payments. Okay, so he's getting the first payment right now and the remainder each year. How much is each annual payment going to be from his jackpot winnings? Two hundred and fifty eight divided by thirty, because he's getting two hundred and fifty eight and thirty equal payments. So what is that? Eighty six? approximately. Okay. So he's going to get uh, $8.6 million. $8.6 million per year. Okay. So now you have the choice. You're this guy. Now, you can take $8.6 million per year. That's the 258 that they're putting on the billboards. That makes you 
really excited. Or the government, or, you know, so basically these are usually run by, you know, the state or whatever. And they say, well, if you'd rather, we can give you the cash right now, in which case we'll give you $124 million. Okay, so if you wait patiently over the entire life of the um, payout, you will be getting a total of $258 million nominally, or $8.6 million each year, versus you can take $124 million right now. What should he do? How do you know? Why are you saying? How do you know? All right, so take the money now. You may not be around for 30 years. This guy doesn't look like he's taking good care of himself. Okay, that's one answer. What else? Yeah. Okay, so it says he's only got $28.96 in his bank account and a stack of bills. So he's also, in addition to not taking good care of himself, he also is showing that he's not particularly good at managing his money, perhaps. But of course, that could be because he hasn't had enough to manage. So hard to say. Okay. What else? What else is going in your head when you're thinking, like, what should he do? Okay, he might be, a, so if he had the right investors or somebody who was helping him out, he could potentially take the money. Well, what do you mean? Like, he said he was going to ask people, he was going to seek advice from people who know about money. He's asking us, people like us. Right? He's not going to, I mean, now, granted, if he goes and asks, you know, like some random person on the street, that might not be good advice, but assuming he's now got enough money that he can ask for good advice, yes. Okay, so you can't answer this question. I mean, everything has a gut reaction, right? Your gut reaction is, well, $8.6 million per year, that's a lot of money. That should be more than enough. I mean, that's sort of your, your natural instinct, okay? However, that's not how you're, that, you don't, that's not thinking like an accountant or an economist, right? That's just thinking like, oh, well, that's a lot of money, okay? What should you advise this guy to do? Okay, now what are the risks of taking the money now and investing it? You, you know, you might have something which you think you can earn interest on, but you might not, right? So let's say we decide to put the money into the stock market. Now, I, you know, over the, from the year 2000 to the year 2006, the market was booming and you can make 15% returns. But between 2008 and 2011, that's a lot. And in fact, returns were negative. So it's not clear that you have a sure thing. You're pretty hard pressed to find a sure thing with positive returns all the time. So that, you, know, you are imposing some risk on the guy. So first, you would ask yourself the question, if you, know, you want to give this guy the best advice you possibly can. What kind of interest rate would you be assuming that you could get if $124 million today is equal to 30 payments of $8.6 million? Okay, so that's question number one. How much is the implied interest in the deal that the state is offering? And then you have to decide, do I think it's better or worse than he could do in the market. So let's say he instead took this 124 and he could invest and earn 10%. Which would be better? Would it be better for him to take the money now or would it be better for him to let the government basically invest it for him? What's another risk of waiting? Or what's the risk of waiting? What if the government goes bankrupt? <laughs> okay, it's possible. <laughs> or... Um, you know, they just, at some point, I mean, I don't see it happening in the future, but what if 10 years from now, the government, some bro somebody takes the, you know, the, the states to court and says, lottery should be outlawed, and there's no more lottery. And there's some risk of, of leaving it there as well. So I don't mean to say that there's only a risk of investment. Okay, so, take a minute or two, five minutes, maybe. And so try and figure out whether you think 
not based on your just gut and your feeling of, wow, 8.6 is a lot of money. Is it, what, what is the implied interest rate that they're offering if $124 million today is exactly equal to the 30 payments of $8.6 million each? And then, based on that, should he take the money now or should he uh, leave it in the, with the state? So yeah, you can use a calculator, you can use tables, you can use a formula, use whatever you want. But come up with some numerical solution to this. Don't just give me your gut here. Okay, so who wants to tell me what I should be doing here? What am I trying to compute? Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, this is fall apart. Okay. Okay, let's just say we have some formula here, which we're going to just leave for a minute, okay? And what am I multiplying that by? Okay. Okay. Okay, so we need some formula that deals with the fact that there's some interest rate, and we have 30 periods, okay? And what else do I need in this? Computation. The payments, okay, the $8.6 million payment. So I'm trying to figure out if I get 30 payments at some interest rate, I don't know what that is yet. Each payment is $8.6 million. What would the interest rate have to be for that to be worth $124 million? Okay, so what is the formula? Well, you can go back to this thing here, okay, which tells you the present value of an ordinary annuity. What's the problem with this formula in our setup? We have an annuity due. So what, how, can I, how can I deal with that? Okay, well, it's the other way, right? Because I get so so what I would be doing here is I would just say, okay, well I get six point six million dollars today, which is worth eight point six million dollars, and then just treat it like a twenty-nine period ordinary annuity. 
Okay, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can also, there's a formula for me. Uh, and what would do as well, but if you don't know it, you can always work around it. Okay, so we're going to need something like one minus one over one point one. No, I'm sorry, one plus r. We don't know r. Okay. Go back. We raise this, just the inside, to the number of periods and then divide by r. Okay, so take this to the, th to the 29th, divided by r, and sorry, isn't it what? Yes, sorry. Parentheses in the wrong place. Okay. And then plus just eight six. Okay, because this is this is adapting this formula for the fact that it's really an ordinary annuity of twenty nine years plus eight point six million dollars right now. And that's the other way of thinking about it. Okay. So what would you get as an interest rate? What? Now you probably need a calculator. This is kind of painful to do without at least something. Or, well, you wouldn't need a calculator. You could have a table. Okay. But what, what are you going to find out? You're going to find out some interest rate. What are you going to do with that when you're making advice to the guy? How are you going to tell him, is this a good deal or not? Okay, so if I think the guy, if I think I can come up with an investment strategy where he can earn 10% per year, what am I going to do? I'm going to compare what I calculate here with 10%. If that's more, I say leave the money there. They're giving you a great return. If less, what do you think it's going to be? If you have to guess. Okay, but just more or less. As a government that's not so... The government is trying to make money off of lotteries. You realize this, right? I mean, anyone who invests or buys lottery tickets, you do realize that you're, subsidi you're basically giving the government your money for the most part, okay? So are they likely to get a generous interest rate? No. What are they going to do? They're going to prey on the fact that this guy... Yeah, he might say 8.6 million sounds like a lot of money, but he also is going to say 124 million sounds like a huge amount of money. I, he's, like, at that point, you're kind of indifferent. If they offered him 100 million or 125 million, he'd probably take either one. Okay? So the government doesn't really necessarily have incentives to offer you a particularly good rate on this deal because they think most people will take the lump sum. They'll cash out early, take the, take the money, and run. And so they're going to try and put a police shoe if they can. Okay? So you want to make sure that when you do your calculation, you think about what you actually believe will be a fair return and what they're offering you and make that comparison. Yeah. Um, no, but neither, neither, I mean, there's another problem, like, how do you know what the tax rate's going to be in 30 years, right? So you kind of have to just make some assumptions that, they don't, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Um, but, you know, you could take into consideration, you could factor in having to pay all the taxes up front versus the present value of the taxes, and that would be fine, too. But... The question is really, what should I do, take it now or take it later? And it's not, you can't answer it just by looking at it and admiring how much money you're going to make. Right? You have to actually answer the question sort of based on some harder and better evidence. Okay. Sorry? So I think I, 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 I think I post, um, post a solution on Blackboard. I think it was like 5.5% or something like that. Something like that. But I don't even, Okay. 
so now let's talk about, um, let me ask you a couple questions here. If you had the choice, would you rather do some more present value problems? And I'm kind of leaning against that because nobody seems that psyched about present value based on my read of the lack of enthusiasm about more present value problems or just shift gears and start talking about cash and receivable. All right. So I assume that you're going to get more present value good stuff in, in other classes, and we can talk about cash and receivables. Okay. So because um, people like cash, I hope. So that, 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 maybe we will get more excited talking about cash today. Okay. So when you see on the balance sheet cash, you often see a single line item for cash and cash equivalents. Okay. But you need to understand what exactly do they put together in cash versus, or cash and cash equivalent. So just because it's together as one line item, if you say how much cash does the company have, that's different from how much cash and cash equivalent. So, um, so sometimes you'll see on the CPA exam, they'll try and trick you by telling you all of the things that are in cash and cash equivalents, and then they'll say, what is the company's cash belt? And then they literally just mean cash. They don't mean the stuff that's in the account line. Okay, so what is cash? Well, we all know it's, you know, that paper money stuff, but it's other stuff too, okay? So it doesn't have to be literally bills, okay? It is um, anything that is available funds on deposit at a bank, so an insured bank, okay? So you don't need, it's not how much cash does the company have in its cash register or in its safe, it's how much does it have available in various deposits in different banks, that counts, okay? Checks that the company has received, even if they haven't yet deposited them, those count, okay, as long as they're not post-date. That's another common CPA trying to mess you up question, like, what do you do with a post-date check? A post-date check is not a check, it's a receivable, okay? So, um, anything, any savings account, any um, coins, cash, real paper cash, bank accounts, and checks, those count as cash. Cash equivalents are Things that will be converted to cash within three months at most, and often even less. They also have to have virtually no risk. So what are the things that are included in those things? Well, treasury bills, which would be government loans to the government, okay? Commercial paper, which is loans to AAA rated companies. So you may or may not agree that AAA rated companies are as risk free as uh, they sound, but the fact, the reason that they're considered to be virtually risk-free is that in addition to being high-quality companies, they're also short-term loans. So you're going to get your payment back within very, a very short amount of time, so the opportunity for GE to go bankrupt in the next three months is very small. Okay. Um, and then any money market funds that, where, especially if there's some sort of um, Prepayment withdrawal or some kind of like withdrawal difficulty, you can't just get at the cash immediately, then uh, it becomes a cash equivalent rather than a immediate cash. Okay. Um, the statement of cash flows, which we pretty much ignored in chapter uh, four or five, I don't know, four, I guess, um, basically tells you what happened to cash over the last year. Okay, it takes the beginning balance in cash and then explains how you got from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, all the activities that happened in the cash account. Okay, if you, some of these things may seem like um, that, that you would have done them differently, and the statement of cash flows basically says, okay, well, we've got a bunch of operating activities for which we get cash. How do we get cash when we operate? Yeah. We sell stuff and take in cash. 
What happens if we sell stuff on credit? Does that affect our cash account? No. So if we wanted to, we would only want to include the sales to our customers that are cash sales. Okay? When you look at a statement of cash flows, you'll usually see an indirect statement of cash flows that will include all of the company's net income, whether it's cash or accrual, right? Cash or receivable. So what the company ends up doing is then they undo their, so they, they take their accrual income and they unravel it and bring it to cash income. But ideally what you're trying to get is all of the cash sales, the cash outflows that go to buy your inventory, any cash outflows that go to pay your employees, but if you pay, if you have wages, a wage expense that didn't requ require cash, you would have to get rid of that, okay? Any taxes that you actually pay and the interest that you actually pay. So these are actual payments of cash rather than accrued expenses, okay? The investing activities on the statement of cash flows are just big purchases of machinery, equipment, fixed assets, land, building, things like that and investments, and then inflows are from the sale of those activities. Okay, so when you think about what can a company, how much cash does the company have to sort of play around with, it's the cash that they bring in from operations minus the cash that they need to reinvest, and then the rest is usually what we call free cash flows. Then you have to take those free cash flows and pay back your debt, or pay off your interest, or you could pay dividends if you want to. Those would be your financing activities. Okay. We are not going, to, I'm not going to ever make you make a statement of cash flows. I'm not even really going to expect you to know how to know very much about the statement of cash flows. But if you see a statement of cash flows, you should know what it is. Okay. <laughs> so you can say, oh yeah, this is what they're doing. They're just trying to reconcile their opening and their closing cash balance. And they're separating it into a couple of categories, the cash that they're generating from operating, the cash that they're generating or using mostly to buy fixed assets, and then the cash that they use for financing activities. That's the way cash flows statements look. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, the cash flow statement is sort of the idea behind the cash basis of accounting, but the thing that's different is we don't usually just take all of the cash items and present them like I've done here. Usually what you see is actually accrual accounting unraveled rather than directly going with cash based accounting. Okay, so we are on an accrual system, so we start with net income, we assume that's cash, and then we say, okay, well, here are all the things that are in net income that weren't related to cash. And here are all the other activities that use cash or didn't use cash. So it's not exactly, exactly. All right, so this is what I was just sort of saying, which is the direct method of the statement of cash flows makes a lot of sense. We would just say, hey, you know, Here's the cash we took in, here's the cash we used, that's what we, we, we present to investors. And 99.9% .9 of companies use the indirect method, which is the one that makes no sense at all, which is we start with accrual accounting, we start with net income, and then we add and subtract all of those things that we just did to make accounting accounting. Right? Well, all the things we did to make the income statement based on accruals, we unravel them. So any expenses that we accrued that we haven't paid, we add those back. Any cash that we, any sales we made that we haven't received the cash, we subtract them. So all of a sudden, all bets are off in terms like, we don't record income when it's, or we don't record cash when it's receivable, we only record cash when it's been received. Okay, now, so that's, that's I, I, I don't want you to feel like you've never seen, so next semester, <laughs> And I think it's like chapter 18, you'll talk about the statement of cash flows in great detail. The reason we don't talk about it now is that we sort of misteach it to you in the beginning, and then you have to unlearn it and relearn it again, so I think that makes no sense. You'll learn it properly once, and you'll learn it properly in intermediate two. 
The thing is, they will say to you, have you ever seen a statement of cash flows? And you're supposed to say yes. So tell them, yes, we've seen one. But we, don't, we, we want to learn how to do it right. <laughs> okay, so the other thing that um, we need to know about cash is, now, has, have any of you ever, you guys still write checks, ever? Not, not easy. All right, some of you have, you have written one, though. Yes? Never? Never written a check. Okay, so what happens when you have a checkbook and you do write a check? What else are you supposed to be doing when you write that check? You're supposed to be balancing your checkbook. Is there, has anybody ever balanced their checkbook? All right, a couple. So what is, I mean, you, you, can, you should be balancing your checkbook when you use a uh, debit card too, technically, right? Okay, so what is, our, what, what is the idea behind balancing your checkbook? It means, all right, I, I put in, let's say I start and I go to the bank and I open an account and I put $500 into it, okay? My mom gave me a birthday present, she gave me a big check, I go and open a bank account. And then I start writing checks. Now, again, I don't mean literally writing checks. I could use my debit card. That's the same thing, okay? I'm just basically depleting my account. And what happens when I deplete my account? Well, I can't, you know, as soon as I spend $500, that's it, right? I can't spend anymore. Now, what would happen if I go to the bank and I use my debit card and I take out $400? But at the same time, I write a check to somebody for $200. Okay, my check bounces, I get a fee, but what else happens? The person who accepted my check is really unhappy as well, right, because they don't have their money. Okay, so, so there's a lot of problems. They also have a $35 charge, and it's really annoying. Okay, so that's not really the problem here. The problem is, I can't spend more money than I don't have. I mean, you can, people do it all the time, but you're not supposed to, okay? So companies need to make sure that they're keeping track of how much money they actually have in their bank account because you don't want to run into the case where you write checks on money that's not there. Not only because it annoys the people and they have a $35 charge, but they're not going to do business with you anymore, right? If you write checks that aren't good. so. Your bank doesn't know what's going on in your checkbook. They only know what's going on in your debit card because that's electronic. And they know what's going on when, you're, when the person who you write a check to goes and deposits it. But there's a point, there's some time in between me writing a check. Like if I wrote a check right now and I gave it to you, until you get to your ATM, you deposit it in your bank, and then your bank settles it with my bank, there's a little bit of time, right? And I could be writing a lot of checks in that period of time, okay? So what we need to do is we need to make sure that the bank and our books are unmeshed, okay? We all agree that the account balances are what they are the same, okay? So the bank every month sends me a bank statement. But when do they send their bank statement? They send it as of like the 31st of the month, or the last day of the month. And by the time I receive the bank statement, it's not really accurate anymore anyway. Moreover, they sent it on the 31st, but I could have written a whole bunch of checks on the 31st that weren't included in that. Okay? So every month, you're supposed to reconcile your bank statement with your books. The presumption is the bank knows more than you do about some activities, and you know more than the bank about some activities, and you just need to reconcile those two things. Okay. Now, not that I'm going to tell you how to live your lives, although I seem to do a lot of that. You should check every once in a while because you will find mistakes. The bank still use humans to code some of the checks, right? So they, to the extent possible, they use electronic check readers, but they don't always. And there are a lot of transcription errors. So you might make a deposit for $2,150, and they'll only deposit $1,250. Okay? Now, what, you know, if, if it went the other way and you made a deposit for $1,250 and you catch the 21, you're like, oh, I don't know what to tell them. But yes, you have to tell them because they'll find out anyway eventually. So, um, so the fact is, there are mistakes. 
and you want to cash them as soon as possible, and you do just need to know that you know your bank account is right. So here's so so the bank gives you a bank statement, and you need to take that bank statement and adjust it for the stuff that you know that the bank doesn't know. So what kind of things do you know that the bank doesn't know? Well, if I make a deposit, so let's say I, you know, I, I have a bunch of stores, and at the end of each day, I have a big package of cash, and I put it in one of those, you know, those big, like, what's called those depository things. I don't know what the, the, the actual thing is called, but okay, there. <laughs> and, and it's sitting there, and I put it in at the end of the day, at close of business, on 1231. And they already made the bank statement at 5 o'clock. So there's a deposit that I've made that I would have in my books, but that the bank doesn't have. Okay. On the other hand, I also could have written a whole bunch of checks today that the bank doesn't know about and that, um, and that haven't been deposited yet or haven't been cashed yet. So there's another set of things. Then it could just be the case that after I review carefully what the bank's done, they've made some mistakes. So I want to fix those. So those are the three things I would want to take the bank statement and adjust for to get to a reconciliation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it depends on what you mean by you don't take into account deposits and transit. If you have gone to the bank and made the deposit, you should include it in, in the reconciliation. However, if you've gone to the bank and made the deposit and the bank was open, you would, be, you would have a deposit slip. Okay, so it, 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 if you have a statement as of the end of 5 o'clock on 1231 and you made the deposit during that day, it's in there. Okay, it's only not in there if you made it after bank hours. Yeah, it, it's only a, it's a difference between the bank statement that you have from the bank and your books. Okay, because on your books you record the deposit when you make the deposit, right? You make up the deposit slip, you fill it out, you put it in QuickBooks, you run to the bank, you deposit it. Whether the bank deposits it or not is unknown. If you deposit it after hours, it's known that it's not in it. Okay, so it's only these very special deposits in transit that the bank has not yet credited you for that you have recorded on your own books. Okay, if you have a bunch of checks sitting in a pile that you haven't deposited, that they don't, they wouldn't be deposits in transit. Okay, they may be deposits that you, have, you know, they may be cash that you have. Okay, but you couldn't expect the bank to know about those, and you wouldn't have recorded the deposit yet because you haven't done anything. You only record the deposit when you actually make the deposit. Okay. So, um, so these are for deposits that you've made but that haven't yet cleared. So sometimes you'll make a deposit at the bank and they won't actually give you credit for it until they make sure all the checks are good. So that would be another situation where you have to, there's a hold on those deposits that wouldn't necessarily be included in your statement. Or checks you've written that haven't been cashed or cleared, bank mistakes. Okay. Then there's the flip side, which is your part where, you know, you know stuff, but that you might have not included in the book. So let's suppose you deposited a bunch of checks and, the, and one of them bounced. Okay. You might not have known that until you received the bank statement. So you get back a bank statement which says you received a check that bounced. So we're not giving you the $100 credit for the check and we're charging you an extra $35. So your bank statement would be $135 lower than what you thought you had according to your books. Okay? The bank just might charge. So let's say you reordered checks or they automatically reordered them for you and then they sent them to you. Well, they charge, you know, unfortunately they charge you for everything. So that would be a service charge. Okay? So well, that's, that's this charge. Okay, other, you know, there are other kind of charges. Interest, if you happen to be lucky and have a 
checking account that bears some interest. You would be that might not be something that you automatically accrued, but you should. And so that would be a deviation between your statement and the bank statement. If the bank is doing any collection of receivables on your behalf, those would be included in the bank statement, but not necessarily in your statement, because you wouldn't have anything that would automatically prompt the recording of the transaction. And then if you made any mistakes, so people make mistakes all the time themselves, if you're entering stuff into QuickBooks, you might have screwed up. Okay, so there's, um, okay, so let's talk about, a, we'll do a quick bank rec, and you can see what the people had to do in the old days. And, um, and for the most part, I think, you know, we're moving in a direction where there's a lot less human error, but you still don't want to be so, uh, I'm so, so far removed from just doing these basic bank reconciliations because you will find mistakes. Okay, last year I actually found, a, I mean, it wasn't my money, so it was a little less exciting finding the mistake, but I'm the treasurer for this organization and they, I found, you know, some mistakes in the, in the bank statement was, you know, $1,000. And $1,000 for an organization that only makes, you know, $30,000 a year is kind of a lot. So you, gotta, you do have to check up on the bank. Okay, so let's say you get your bank statement, and it says you have $30,000 in the bank. Okay, so as of May 31st, 2011, they send you the bank statement. They have all the checks, Xerox, you know, microfilm, uh, and copies of them. So you can see all the checks that have cleared. Okay, and you can and you notice, well, I have written $4,900 worth of checks that haven't yet cleared, okay, either because the people who I wrote the checks to haven't made the time to deposit them, or they just haven't um, gotten, you know, gotten from their bank to my bank, or whatever it is, there's, there's a bunch of checks out there that I've written, but I haven't been charged for. On the other hand, I made some deposits that the bank has not given me appropriate credit for, because at the end of the day, on 531, I made a deposit, according to my books, that's money that I had as of May 31st, but according to the bank, they won't necessarily give it to me until, say, uh, June 3rd, okay, especially if there are checks included in that deposit. All right, so this is a deposit I made. Also, the bank... Let's say I have an account receivable. I sell some stuff to somebody, and I tell the bank, "Hey, will you be my collect? Will you collect the money for me directly?" So instead of them writing me a check and then me depositing it, they just send the money, wire it directly to the bank. Okay, so the bank is collecting the note for me. How much cash do I really have? Do I have thirty? Like if you said on May thirty-first, here's what the company should report as its cash balance, what should it report? Should it report the bank statement of $30,000? Should it report 35.4? Should it report 30.25.1? Uh, should it report some combination of those things? What, what should it do? So g give me some, what do you think? Okay, so the bank, if they've collected it, shouldn't it already be in there? Okay, so I don't need to add it again, right? So the book, the bank, has it right. Now my books would have that, might not have that. So I would, if I want to get from my books to the bank, i got to worry about that. All right, how about the deposit in transit? Is that money I should include or not? Yes, okay, so 54. How about the outstanding checks? Is that money I should exclude or not? Exclude, so what am I is it actually recording? Yeah. Isn't it in there? Okay, so that's the thing. You gotta, you gotta decide who knows what and what's included in which account. Now, if instead I had told you the balance per my books, 
Okay? And here are the only pages of information. Then this is the only thing we would include because that would be the only place where I was off. Okay? So you've got to figure out who knows what and what's been included. I use a bank statement and I reconcile it based on the information in my books or I use my book information and I reconcile it to the bank. I should end up with the same number whichever direction I go.